<laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's working, yes. Good morning, everyone. Yes. Yeah. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for, for coming out and joining us today for our uh, ceremony acknowledging uh, National Truth and Reconciliation Day. Um, I'll start with a few words before we ask our elder to uh, start us off in a good way. Miigwech, everybody, for coming out. The, um, I'd like to acknowledge that the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre operates on sacred land. We are on the traditional lands of the people of Fort William First Nation, territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, and home of the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. Today, Thunder Bay is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work together in this community and on this territory. T today, we gather to commemorate tr uh, National Truth and Reconciliation Day, also known as Orange Sh Shirt Day. This annual day of reconciliation encourages Canadians to learn about the history of residential schools. It is held on September 30th because that is the time of year when Indigenous children were taken from their homes, from their families, from their communities to attend residential schools. From the 1880s until the last school shut down in 1996, Canada's residential school system forced approximately 150,000 children <clears throat> to attend church-run facilities aimed to take the Indian out of the child. Students faced widespread neglect and abuse in the schools. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission investigation led to the release of the report that included 94 recommendations for change. Orange T-shirt day began following the story of residential school survivor Phyllis Webstad. <clears throat> a legacy of the St. Joseph's Miss uh, Mission res uh, School commemoration every e event held in Williams Lake, British Columbia, in the spring of 19, I mean 2013. On Phyllis's first day of school, she presented with a beautiful orange t-shirt, uh, a beautiful orange shirt that her mother had purchased for her. Once she was in the school, the shirt was removed from her and she never seen her shirt again. So at the event in 2013, Phyllis wore her orange shirt again to, to take back her herself, to get back what she lost that day. And that started this movement of Orange Shirt Day on September 30th. Many communities host activities much like ours today and the other event, um, activities include walks, different types of ceremony, feasts, gatherings, film screenings, and public le lectures to raise awareness and share knowledge of our shared past. <clears throat> Additionally, school boards across Canada have begun using this day to teach the children about Indian residential schools. Communities and organizations are unveiling two powerful Oops, sorry, communities and organizations commemorate the day in different ways. And here at the hospital, we have two events. We're introducing um, our teepee and we're, in, and we're gonna be unveiling some artwork. This, the teepee that stands before us is, is, a, is a strong symbol for the hospital. It's how we're bringing in safe space, and respectful space for Indigenous people to gather, to meet, and to have ceremony. <clears throat> the mural that we're going to be unveiling shortly is in the hospital, and it's at the bottom of the grand staircase right outside of the cafeteria. So to start us off, I'm going to introduce Mariah, our elder, who's going to have a ceremony, share a cer ceremony with us and some smudging. 
And then we're going to have uh, some of the ladies here sing some songs and play their hand drums for us. Oh. Oh, bonjour. Makade big wajimi ingin din cause it. Megazi do dem. Nimki waju and doji. My uh, Christian name is Mariah Ishwega. I'm, uh, my spirit name is Black Timberwolf. I'm from the Eagle, Eagle Clan, and I'm from Fort William First Nation. Uh, I'd like to honor this day of truth and, Rel and reconciliation day uh, for our people. Who have the survivors that are going through a lot with this, and for the children that were found, they're the ones that have opened up our eyes and our strength that we have within us to go through with this. I thank the Creator for Mother Earth, as this Earth does not belong to anybody, not just any one person. It belongs for us to be able to eat. Our food grows on, on Mother Earth and our, uh, our water runs through the veins of Mother Earth. Without, without any of that, we would not be able to survive. And our, our ISIS in the, in the north and in the south, the icebergs, those huge icebergs, Mother Earth will pay that back because you're not treating her properly. You all have to remember to treat Mother Earth as she was your own mother. Have care. And even our water, our drinking water, is very, very important to us. As they said once long ago that we will be drinking water out of bottled water. And sure enough, it's happening. Where at one time we'd be able to go to the water and just drink it with our hand out of the out of the rivers. The streams, that's how clear our water used to be at one time. I recall that as a young girl drinking water from a creek. And our plants and our medicines grow out on our land and our medicines help us if we talk to the right people the right elders they can help you so I thank you for all being here and sharing this As for myself, my my father was a residential school survivor. Uh, he passed on, but he was one of the survivors. So I'm like a next generation down from that. It's uh, 
it's not easy to go through. I'm also a uh, Indian Day School survivor. And I've learned, I've learned in my times to, to go to my culture and to learn from that. Where we, where as children growing up, we thank the creator for this beautiful sunny day. And to uh, enjoy yourselves. How to make which. Hello, my name is Wendy Carroll. Um, my ancestral ties, ties are with Batchawana Bay First Nations. We have chosen four songs for you today, uh, the first of which is called Wildflower. The reason why we have chosen this song is because the story behind that song is that the wildflowers, our children, are the wildflowers. Traditionally, this song was sung by women who were calling their children back to them. And so we sing this song today to call back um, our children to us. Miigwech.
Bonjour. The next song that we're going to be singing is uh, the bear song. Um, I am Aquadotum, and the bear in our in our culture, they're the medicine keepers. They're the protectors. They're the ones that take all the other ones in, and uh, so we're going to honor the Makwas and the, um, the healing and the protectors. Miigwech. Our third song is going to be called, it's called a life-giving song. Uh, this song has originated from uh, Saugeen First Nation. Uh, it was given to us by an elder from there. Uh, the song was sung at sun dances, and it was to give them strength when they did uh, the piercings and the lifting of them 
from that. So it was sung to help give them strength. So we're singing it to help give all our people and everybody strength to uh, understand what we are going through. Uh-huh, Chimiguich.
Our next song <coughs> will be the traveling song. Uh, as uh, you came here, we didn't know each other. We've met, and uh, for you to have a safe journey back to wherever you are going. Uh huh, Jimmy, which. Miigwech, ladies. Thank you very much. I should have probably did this earlier, but I'm going to introduce all the ladies who sang for us today. At the end is Annette Clement. She works with us here at the hospital. She works specifically with myself and Chris Musquash, our EDP in, in research. Uh, beside her is Wendy Carroll, and she's a manager at Anishinaabe Mishkiki, an organization that we work very closely with. And uh, Wendy uh, accompanies us often when we have cultural events and and cultural singing and prayer. And and she she um, that that's her path in life as well. And beside Wendy, we have Michelle Yance, and and she agreed to come in and share and be a part of our special day today. And uh, we've introduced Elder Mariah. So again, ladies, miigwech. So I'm going to ask our president and CEO, Rhonda crocker Ellicott to come up and share some words with us. Thank you, Crystal. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you and recognize the wonderful singing and drumming um, from all of you. Annette, Wendy, Michelle, Elder Mariah, beautiful and what a wonderful way to 
recognize the day today. Thank you, Miigwech. Today, it's really with mixed emotions that, that I come to speak with you today. It's with mixed emotions about the sadness and the grief of the past, the unacceptable past, the loss, the tremendous loss of identity, of culture, and sometimes even life. However, with all of that tragic past comes an opportunity for learning, an opportunity for learning, for truth, and for reconciliation. And really today can be an opportunity to recognize how through collaboration and learning and growth, we can take the opportunity to make changes and make differences in the future. As a hospital, we have deeply embraced truth and reconciliation and the overall reconciliation process. We're working very hard to really create safe spaces for, for people. Today, the unveiling of the teepee, looking at the teepee as an opportunity to create some safety, to create an opportunity to gather, a place for ceremony and overall support. I do want to recognize that the Health Sciences Foundation supported um, and funded the TP uh, through a, a care grant. And I want to also recognize the Indigenous um, Advisory Circle um, that works with Crystal that came up with the idea and uh, was able to move this forward. So miigwech, thank you to all of you. Moving forward as an organization, we're deeply committed to change. Uh, that's been identified in our strategic plan 2026 identifying and embedding truth and reconciliation and those calls to action as an organization and in our hospital. We've embedded Indigenous navigators into our care system and we're really looking to our navigators and collaborators to work in partnership with our communities and people to ensure safe and culturally appropriate care and safe transitions home. Today is really a small example of some of the work that we are doing along the journey to truth and reconciliation and along the journey to our strategic priority around equity, diversity and inclusion. We take as an organization this role incredibly seriously. We're all committed at all levels to this and really remain committed to healing and reconciliation moving forward. So miigwech in honor of the past and in respect of the past and with hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. So um, just a few words about the teepee um, and its significance here. Like Rhonda said, this was um, the, the, teepee, the teepee is in response to uh, many requests for Indigenous people to have a place to go to gather, to have ceremony and feel safe in doing that. And uh, Indigenous Advisory Circle who make up, who have representatives from many organizations in our community. Um, we, they've been, they created this table long before I came to the hospital in 2018. And they decided that the teepee would be a good uh, starting point in creating those spaces because it does allow for ceremony we could light a fire in our teepee we could have smudging ceremony in addition to other ceremonies uh, where in the hospital we're limited to one space to do that so the planning began with about 26 of us in a room and uh, we quickly were running in circles in terms of who's going to do what and and it took one of um a former employee to say, well, we're going to structure ourselves in committees and everybody will appoint leads and every lead will have workers and we'll have all have our parts and pieces. And um, so we, we started that journey in terms of identifying a process and who was going to do what. And then um, it was actually, I believe, Caitlin who came to me and said, hey, there's this opportunity to apply for funds and so that we could start paying for some of the work we want to do. And we were very, very fortunate that the foundation approved our our request so that we could have money to 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 buy the supplies for to put a TP up. That started before the pandemic. And um, for for our TP, the pandemic was actually a kind of a blessing 
that it postponed and made us move at a, at a snail's pace in, in making this happen today. The plans we had created um, way back in probably early 2019, where we could have had this done in 60 days. And, um, but because of the pandemic, we kind of put the brakes on gathering because we weren't allowed to do that. And we all wanted to retreat and, and keep ourselves safe so we could keep our family safe. And then eventually we started meeting virtually and phone calls and saying, we got to start picking up and doing what we were doing before we can't just let this not happen. So we started and um, the last, so we agreed that uh, the leads would, would continue to do what they need to do and, and with, within their small groups, feedback to the hospital, what we're going to do next, next steps and who's going to be where and, and stuff like this. And when it came time to, we were ready to order the TP. We reached out to who were going to be the suppliers and, and they were stores, right? They, they, they specialize in TP material in addition to other indigenous um, uh, materials for different events like wigwams and, and, and uh, sun dances and stuff like this. And to our dismay, we were told we don't have enough material to do that. We, we don't have any teepees available and we're not going to have material. And I was beside myself because I'm like, well, where am I going to get canvas to make a teepee and, and get it here on time so that today we would have a teepee? And I was starting to feel the pressure and I, for the life of me, I couldn't find a resource in Canada to find a teepee, to buy a teepee. No one had enough canvas. And so I reached out to one of my friends and, and it was not uh, to ask her to give me a teepee or find me a teepee, but I asked, I, I was calling her to talk about how frustrated I was and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I knew she would calm me down and set me off in a good direction mentally to, to figure this out. Well, not only did she do that, she said, hey, my friend makes teepees and she has enough material for your teepee. So she connected me with her friend and she's an indigenous woman. She's Ojibwe. And this teepee is what her family does. She's the fourth generation maker of teepees. She lives in her community and her family is known for this. So that's why I said it, it was the, for the teepee and, and the actual structure being here today the pandemic was a part of that plan because now we have something made by our people who have a long history in doing that and that's their calling they recognize that's that's what they do for our people this is what they bring and she comes from Peguis first nation in in manitoba her name is irene so and and i thanked her many many times for her family and, and her willingness to learn this skill and carry on their traditions. Our teepee was put up last week under the guidance of an elder from our territory. He comes from White Sand First Nation. Many of you probably know him. His name is Ernie Kwandabens. And his wife, Charlotte, they spent a day here with a number of us, including a small team of four, to put the teepee up. And even though everyone who was brought here to put the teepee up had a lot of expertise, a lot of experience, and they're known that this is what they do in our community, on that day, there were lessons to be learned. They learned more, more traditions on why we do what we do when we're putting up a teepee. So, um, you know, everybody came thinking, we know what we're doing and we're just going to do it and we'll be done in an hour and a half. Well, three and a half hours later, everybody was saying thank you. You know, I didn't know that. It was nice to be here. Nice to see you again. And that's what Indigenous gatherings are. Whether we're gathering for like the past and what we're commemorating today, the sadness, the grief, the anger, the atrocities of the past, we have to look forward to the good. We have to bring in laughter. And the teepee is going to allow us to do that here at the hospital. It's going to create that safe space where we can be ourselves. 
where it's not, we're not going to worry about, you know, whether we're crying too loud, laughing too loud, or bring too many of our children, or just need to have a ceremony in the spot, a smudge, and who we want to bring with us to do that. So this is what this allows us today. And that's a part of who we are as a people. When we have ailments, it's not just about, let's say, our broken finger. It's about bringing together and healing from a holistic, so our spiritual, our mental, our physical. We, we have to heal the whole, the whole of us to get better and to go forward. And the TP contributes to that, allows us to be able to do that. <clears throat> We're going to be having an official ceremony for the TP once we can bring our partners together to participate in that. It didn't feel right to have an official opening ceremony for the TP itself with our partners who contributed a lot of time, energy, and bringing their expertise, their knowledge, and their shared culture. So once we can gather, we'll be having an event out here to honor the structure that's going to be here available for each and every one of us going forward. <clears throat> So before I, before I, I end, there's um, I know we're not in a meeting, but in the hospital, we always have, um, we always start off with humanizing what we're doing and why we do it. And when we're in meetings, we call them patient stories. So today I'm going to humanize a little bit of why we're gathering. I'm going to make it present. So in our circle, as wobbly as it looks, we're in a circle. Amongst us, we have residential school survivors. Amongst us, we have day school survivors. And amongst us, we have people who have found a way forward from that hurt, that pain, and that loss. I'll quickly share with you a little bit about my story. I was born in 1967 to a residential school survivor. And she chose to give me up at birth. I was adopted. I became a part of the 60s scoop era. I always say I was very, very fortunate that eventually I found the right home. My parents came. They picked me up. And they're Ojibwe. They're both moved on in their journey during the spirit world. They've been there for almost 30 years. I was one of six kids that they adopted. And when I was a baby, their cultural practice was trapping, hunting, gathering, fishing, and living off the land completely. So I grew up my first seven years of my life, I was in the bush on the trap line. <coughs> I gained a lot of skills and knowledge that school could never teach me when I was on the land. I learned the value of being here. I learned the value of being a girl being a daughter, a sister, an auntie, a granddaughter. I was valued. <coughs> and I had a role. I was important. So that when I learned, as I was approaching my teenage years, that I was adopted, I was so secure in my life. I didn't have a downward spiral to the extent that others did. I was a confident person. I knew my parents loved me. I knew my brothers and sisters loved me. I knew my grandparents were my grandparents. I knew I had a role in my family and I knew I was important. So I, I did go off the rails a little bit in terms of why did they give me up? Why was I not good enough? You know, what was so special in their life at the time that they made a baby and they couldn't take the baby home? And why me? Why did they give me up? Was it me? Was I not enough? So when I heard I was adopted by another little girl, who actually was my biological sister, I come to learn, I went running home to my mom as fast as my little legs could take me. And I went running up to her and I said, Mom! Virginia told me you're not my mom. 
Is that true? Is Doris my mom? My mom looked at me and she grabbed me. And she goes, you'll always be my little girl. Doris gave birth to you, but you're my daughter. You're our daughter. This is your family. And when she said that, everything I experienced up till then in terms of what a family should be is what stayed with me. And I was okay. Most days I'm still okay. I have moments. You don't always stay okay. One of my friends I used to know used to say, once in a while, we have to go for a little fresher upper. And for me, that means going back on the land, remembering where I came from. Reminder. So the lady who gave birth to me, I was able to forgive her. I accept her for who she is today and the decision she made. The man who helped made me, I forgive him too. He made his decisions for his good reasons. And I accept that. So the atrocities of the past are not in the past were before you. We bring all of our baggage and all of the good. So that's how, we, how I choose to humanize today. How to make it real. That it's a part of who we are. Today, all of us. We walk together. I'm going to end it on a really positive note. We're going to, I'm going to ask Ryan to come up here and share his words. Because Ryan Newman, better known as Ryan Pullman, is a fantastic artist. Very, very skilled. And he's, he does tattoos too. I'm waiting for him to open up his bookings because he's going to, Make me an Ojibwe flower on my body to carry proudly and my clan, which is on my skirt, my frog. So I'm going to ask Ryan to come up and share with us his vision, a little bit about him and the artwork we're going to see inside the hospital after he goes in and has an opportunity to unveil it. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Newman, yeah, or Pooh Man, yeah. And uh, I'm from Fort William First Nation and a full-time tattoo artist at High Tide Tattoo Parlor. And um, yeah, so the piece I created, it was um, very inspired by uh, the traditional kind of natural foods and everything that like, and the connection, the representation that indigenous people have to the land and the food, like I've included fish, moose berries and everything and uh yeah it's just to the connection to the land that we all share and yeah it's pretty much it for that but, yeah miigwech thank you ryan no problem once you see the artwork today you'll as you traverse through areas of the city you'll say, that has to be his work because you'll recognize his style. It's so beautiful. And um, I seen his work before I knew Ryan or met Ryan or <coughs> had any idea of who the creator was of this artwork. When uh, one of my friends, uh, actually Ryan's friend reached out to me and said, hey, I have this guy, he wants to do some work, artwork and stuff. And then, so of course, I do what everybody else does. I went on uh, Google and, and looked for him. And I, I was so happy to see that the person that wants to do work is the person's work I've been admiring for some time in the city. So very, very exciting times for us. So um, that pretty much concludes our morning and our ceremony. Um, but because and, and respecting the pandemic and our response to pandemic guidelines, um, Ryan's going to go in with a few people and unveil his artwork for the people who are already in the cafeteria and um, 
who are sitting there and can enjoy this 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 opportunity and the rest of us i guess we'll get to see it when we when we're in the hospital or passing through or have to come in for some reason or another hopefully it's to you know for something happy so before we um before we end thank you miigwech for coming out for being a part of today for wearing orange for acknowledging the past and for being here and motivated to make change for the future miigwech how how